One of life's greatest questions is, what happens to us after we die? Is death the end or a new beginning? Welcome to the Round Trip Death Podcast. In this show, we listen to first-hand accounts of people who have gone beyond the veil and return to talk about it. We're here with Allison Snowden today down in Florida. How are you? I'm doing great. Don't tell me it's warm and sunny. It is absolutely gorgeous, and I'm looking outside my window, and it's just absolutely blue, blue water, and super sunny, and it's about 75 degrees. All right, I'm headed down there right now. Yes. You know, lately we have been talking, for some reason, we've had some um, not only interesting near-death experiences that we've heard of, but the way people died has been really interesting as far as somebody getting hit by a van, somebody getting hit by a train and drug, things like that. I'm just teasing it for our listeners a little bit. You might actually have one of those kind of different things too. We'll come back to that. First, tell us a little bit about you. Yes, yes. Yeah. So um, my name is Allison Snowden. Um, I have my doctorate in Chinese medicine and in holistic healing. I like to say mind, body, soul healing. Um, and that's the the result of my the incident that happened that uh, in 1999. Currently, I'm a 39-year-old um, holistic doctor. I practice uh, integrative medicine, mostly energy uh, healing from the subconscious side, and um, I just love helping people. It is one of my sole missions while I'm alive is to really teach people how to heal themselves, and that's emotionally, physically, spiritually, mentally Um, And that is one of my sole missions from my NDE. And it just makes me so incredibly happy to help, to help people like access this power within them uh, to heal themselves, to know who they are. That's great. Let the record show. I did not ask your age. Okay. (laughs) Let's, let's go back to when you were 15 years old, where were you? What in the world happened? So I always like to share a little bit before this because um, I think, you know, what happened, my near-death experience was March 29th, uh, 1999 in Cancun, Mexico. Um, But I think the, to set the stage of this, this was an answer to my prayer and, and, and this could probably shock some people, but uh, my near-death experience was a huge, huge manifestation of of my prayers, and and the reason why that was happening was is that I was exposed to a lot of death when I was younger. Um, my sister, my older sister, who's still alive, she had childhood cancer back in the late '80s, so I saw a lot of children suffer. This is when children were, you know, still conscious when they were doing, uh, spinal taps. Uh, you know, it was, I saw a lot of kids in physical pain. I saw a lot of kids die. And, um, my sister, you know, I saw, I went to probably 10 plus kids funerals, which is very abnormal. And then my cousin died. And so around the age of four. 14, after my cousin died in a traumatic accident, he fell asleep at the wheel. I was like, what is going on? Did you grow up in a religious family that helped you deal with that? No, no. I mean, I went to, so my like family atmosphere that I grew up in, my dad was a physician who was a OBGYN and my mom was a, a nurse. And we, I grew up Catholic, but my, my family, my parents are very ethical, grounded people, but I was very interested in the spiritual aspect. They liked Catholic religion because it was like good values, but they weren't very spiritual. And so I always was, you know, praying and thinking more on that level and it didn't come from them. Okay. 
So what were you praying for specifically? So what happened was, is once that happened with my cousin, Andrew dying, I would just pray. And I, and cause I was like, what is going on with this world? Like, I didn't understand. I, was, I didn't understand. Like I had this deep feeling that there was this, you know, there was something else, but you know, my teenage brain was like, wait, what the, you know, insert a cuss word. Like there's all of these beautiful kids dying, my cousin dying, there's all of this suffering. And so I just had, was having what I call an existential crisis. And I was like, what is going on? And then I, I think hindsight looking, I had some, you know, anxiety and some PTSD around, you know, people dying. Cause I'm like, well, who's next? So I just was praying because I really wanted really the answers to the universe. I wanted to understand why I was here. Why did some people die? Why some people lived? Why is there suffering in this world? And why would a God allow suffering in this world? And what is this whole life about? And then my biggest question was, what happens when you die? And you had really big questions for anybody, let alone a 14-year-old. Yeah, I, I, I was just really in, you know, in that ex- existential cri- crisis. And I, I felt like I had this, this yearning for under this, this yearning to understand really deeply. And, and people's answers weren't really fulfilling me. It didn't feel like truth. And that was before really the internet, you know, I mean, the internet was kind of, going at that time in 97, 98, but it's not something that we went and like Googled, you know, oh, what happens after you die? And then you get near death experience people on there. Right. So I just prayed and I, I tell my, my friends and my clients and how, how much our, the universe feels our desires and our tr- through wanting, because I wanted to know, like, it was a strong thing that I wanted. I was like, show me, I want to know. And I, and I persisted. So that was like something that was very private for me. I did not really share this with my friends. You know, most of my friends at that time had no experience with death you know, they, and, and I had had this long history. And so it was one of these things that I kind of put it in a private place in my room. I wouldn't talk to people around and I had this connection and I would just pray that I, I needed, I needed to know. Yeah. So a little while later, you found yourself, you were in Mexico in the Cancun area. Yes. So then, you know, I'm living a teenage life, you know, like that's in the background, you know, privately that no one knew. Um, and then fast forward, it was, uh, 1999. We were going there for my sister's spring break, but my sister at the last minute got sick and she got diagnosed with a autoimmune disease and her, her infectious disease doctors said, there's no way you can go to Mexico your immune system's not good. Um, but my, everything had been paid for. So we went anyway. So this was around the third, I was, uh, the fourth night. Um, and this was a very auspicious, uh, you know, the first night in Mexico, we almost get in a car accident because like a taxi almost lands in a ditch because there's construction. So that's the first night. The second night, or the second day I was on a bus and the, the guy was drunk, you know, and so he was swerving, you know, the third day we we're coming out of a restaurant and like someone had just gotten hit by a car or a bus. And I, I have a, I still have this memory in my brain and this, they were lifting this person on up on a gurney and their leg was like dangling. And I can remember just cringing not knowing that the next night that would be me. <laughs> so the the next night, um, I was, uh, I went out to dinner with my whole family and then my mom allowed me and my friend to go 
um, out with my sister's friends. And then we had to be home at like, like 10 45 at the latest. And so uh, we went out with my sister's friends and then I lost my friend I was there with. And so I, I essentially got very scared, um, because she was my responsibility and I took that seriously. And so I told one of my friends, one of my sister's friends, Hey, I need to go find her. I need, I need to go. And he's like, calm down, calm down. I thought he was brushing me off. And so I left by myself because I was like, no one's taking me seriously. I need to go. And so I went to go get my mom. And so I left without anyone And so I went and I uh, was walking by myself. So I'm a 15 year old girl um, walking by herself. And I remember some people following me. um, And I remember getting very upset and turning around and telling them a couple, you know, cuss words and yelling at them to get away from me. And I started running. So I started running and in Cancun, there's some, you know, busy streets. So I was trying to get across the street to go to a bus. And all of a sudden, um, I just like my consciousness, you know, it just went blank. Like it was just like, just blank. Like I got knocked out or something. And then ne- next thing I know, I'm, I'm on the ground and I don't really know where I'm at. And I, and I feel like I'm, I'm getting sexually assaulted and I start just fighting for my life, just fighting, trying to hit, but I couldn't move my arms and I was just screaming. And then all of a sudden there was a blank of consciousness. And then the next thing I know is that I am out of my body looking like, and when I say out, because I know there's certain different layers of, you know, near death experiences, I mean like hundreds of feet, like above, like very out of my body. So I was looking like at a very bird's eye view of what was, well, maybe not hundred. That's kind of, that's kind of a little bit exaggerated, but very, very high up. And what I saw was my body. I call it like this, this body that I'm in, um, was just lifeless. And I was in a pool of blood and there was ambulance trying to get through. And, um, there was just this huge pool of blood. There's this whole human drama of the scene going on. And at that time in my near death experience, I kind of was like, Oh, whatever, you know, like people were like, well, what was happening? You know, like, da 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 da. And the thing was, is that I could sense like, I could sense people's feelings. Uh, So like, I can remember this guy, he was very upset of what had happened to me. I can remember sensing his compassion, you know, like the roads were like blocked off because there was police, police and all of that. And I can remember seeing that and I can remember sensing people's feelings, seeing what was happening. But really when I was in my near death experience, it was, it really wasn't the object of what was going on with like the drama of the aftermath of, of the trauma wasn't really like the object of my attention because I was so in this loving consciousness. And that's pretty common um, of people looking down on their body and not really being kind of ambivalent, like, yeah, you know, whatever. Right. Yeah. For some reason, it's not traumatic. It's not, oh, how do I get back to it or anything like that? It's just, oh, yeah. Yeah. There's my dead body down there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I was like, I was super, I was so detached. Like, you know, I, I, I've done a lot of healing work to really love like my human vessel that I'm in right now. But my soul was like, oh, I'll just get another one. It's just kind of like, this, the amount of detachment to the physical body is like, if I miss a sweat, like if, if I have to, you know, throw away a sweater and get another one, it's like, Oh, right. that, that, that sweater was cool, but I'll get another one. Like that's like, and, and my, and my, my brain actually, or like my, my soul actually said that, Oh, well, Oh, Oh, I'm dead. Well, I guess I could get another body. You know, it was one of those things like, Oh, yeah, just kind of like no big deal. So what actually had happened to your body? My parents were told, because my mom wasn't with me at the time, the police told her that I was hit by like a motorcycle or a motor vehicle. First, they said I was on one, and then they said I was hit by one or maybe that or like a car. 
you could tell that something that hit me because my shoes, there was like ingrained tread marks. My left, my left whole left side was destroyed. What happened was, is like my left leg. So that's your left lower leg. My tibia and fibula were a double compound fracture. Also uh, rupturing my tibial artery. So that was the extreme loss of blood. Um, my pelvis, so my butt bone and my pubic bone were broken in four different places. Most of my ribs were broken. Um, and then my r- left arm, the humerus, your upper arm was just pummeled like in like 200 pieces. Um, and then my jaw was broken in four different places. So the, the police at the scene uh, charged a Mexican guy uh, for manslaughter at the scene. Um, and they hauled him off to jail. So some people are like, well, how dead were you? Or, you know, cause I get the question a lot, like how long? And I was like, I don't know. I felt, I mean, the concept of time guys, time doesn't exist outside this human 3d realm. So when I was up in the, you know, the beautiful, like unconditional loving divine conscious plane. I was like, I felt like I was up there forever. You know, I was just, I had so much fun. You know, there is no time constraints up there. It's very interesting to try to translate that, but I guess I was in terms of the timeline on, on human terms, I was, I was, I guess dead enough, or they thought I was going to die or, you know, dead for so much for them to actually very much charge him and convict him of manslaughter. But I woke up uh, slightly in the ambulance and then I kind of passed out again. And then I, and then I woke up again and, and in one of the worst probably facilities called a hospital in Mexico, um, it was like a dilapidated building and uh, dirt, my blood everywhere. I mean, it was uh, not not a good place to be if you're critically injured. So, <laughs> no, you'd think in a tourist place like Cancun that they would have something better than that, and maybe now they do. I don't know. I don't know either. Do you want to tell us more about this? You, I mean, you've mentioned words like beautiful and loving and things like that. Let's go more into depth of what the experience was like when you were felt like you were out of your body. My experience was it, I was in this uh, non-physical place, non-visual place, and it was pure consciousness. So I, there was no visual component. It was all a feeling and a consciousness. So like a vibration, it was this very loving, loving force. So if you can think about the person that you love the most of when you see them or when you're with them and you times that by like... F- trillion times a trillion times a trillion times a trillion. It is that, that, that is what we come from. And it was just this big consciousness, just, just wrapping me up with love. And within that consciousness, because, you know, there are no bodies up there. There are, it's just pure consciousness. I, I didn't know where I ended and I, I didn't know where I began at the same time. I could sense I had my own self-awareness as me as a individual consciousness. And I could sense that there was some, you know, old, there were some consciousness or souls that weren't as aware or self-aware. And then there was some older, like kind of, all, you know, more advanced souls that were more conscious, but we were all in this energy field of oneness of, of love. And there's all, it was all telepathic communication. And so I was having conversations and at one point I'm having all of these conversations because, you know, all of this information, all of the spiritual information is there. It's just, once you're out of your body and you're um, awakened to all of these truths that just kind of, it just comes to you and you're And so I was having these conversations, these awakenings, these knowings. And at one point I was like, am I talking to my, my higher self or God or an angel or, and, and I was like, oh, who cares? Like, cause it's all one type thing. It was like, whatever. But some of the things that were shown to me, obviously uh, I wasn't my body. Like I existed beyond my mind, beyond my body and beyond my personality 
And so it, that was the obvious thing of my near death experiences is, is that we do go be, we are, we are so much more than, you know, what society pretty much puts us in a box, which is, you know, your job, your, you know, what you look like, you know, you know, your status, um, you know, your skin color, um, all of that, or your eye color, your gender. And so my identity, you know, just got blown open that that is those, those kind of little things of my skin color, like my gender, like that is not who I am. Who I am is this consciousness that's like an invisible force. And also what I saw too was, I say saw, but it wasn't saw, it was this knowing, it was this, this, this data bank of all of my previous life experiences or my previous reincarnation or my incarnations. And so I grew up Catholic. I had never been exposed to even the idea of reincarnation. I think now, I don't know what it's like to grow up in this time and space, but, you know, in 1983 up to 89, like I wasn't exposed to world religions. Like I didn't even know what reincarnation was. Like I was, that, that, that had never even come into my field of knowing as like a, as a ninth grader. So when I got into that space and I was, it was, it was just, here's a data cal like categorizing all your previous lifetimes. Do you want to look and explore them more? And I was like, Oh, and then I had this knowing this other knowing that you in between lives, you would study yourself. And so there was this, also this other knowing that everything that you do in your life is recorded by this loving field of consciousness, you know, all your thoughts, all of your actions, all of, you know, what was going on with you, all of this is recorded, like nothing is missed, nothing, like every little thing. And I don't know, that made me feel super happy still makes me feel super happy. And I didn't have a life review, like in my thing, but I guess when you do truly end your life, you, you have all of these, all of this data to look. And, and I guess some religions say that you're judged. Well, that is just really not the case. There is this learning and this love you get to see and you get to feel. And I think the thing is, is that God doesn't judge. It's really our souls and our consciousness that are really just evaluating and looking. And I think as you go through or what I sense from myself, as I move through different lifetimes, I had different goals or different, not different goals, but more of a spiritual sense of experience and wanting to understand and cultivate. I know that the divine intelligence knows, like maybe there's a misunderstanding Maybe, you know, justice doesn't get served on my part on some level in some situation, but I find a lot of peace, like knowing that, that this divine consciousness or this field knows my true intentions. I, I get, I get a good sense of it. Maybe that might scare some people <laughs> if there's something, um, knows everything that's going on. That's okay. Let me interject. I noticed you used the term divine consciousness. Some other people use the term God. Why did you choose one versus the other? Because for me, um, I guess maybe coming from a Catholic um, upbringing, I think of, I feel like God is personified as a male or, you know, as um, in some religions, and so I, I use the word just divine consciousness because I feel like the God that I met or the divine consciousness that I met is, is a pure energy. It's not a person. It's a pure energy that we all are a part of and we all make up into this big unified field. And so, and all it is, is love. And that's all it is. And I feel like because of other re religion has projected a, a lot of human-like qualities onto this energy field. So if I would write a book about my near-death experience, it'd probably be like two pages. I mean, besides doing this, this whole thing, it's just basically God is love. Love is God. Like end of story. Like that's it. But that's really difficult for us humans because we make things so complex. Like what does that mean? What is love? Like what is, 
what is love? What does that actually feel like? Also in my healing profession and also a lot of people in humans call love that isn't love. You know, a lot of humans maybe feel like they were loved, but that's not, that love is not the love that I felt, you know, when I was the, the, the high vibrational love that I felt is, is, is very different than a lot of things or energies or frequencies that people call love here, you know, and also a a lot of the people I do healings with their consciousness thinks love is abuse or love is a certain judgmental. And so I think there's a lot of confusion around love in general, in, 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 in our culture. And, but the, the feeling I got when I was in my near death experiences is, is just, it's, no words can describe it. And once you, once you feel it, you're completely changed. You mentioned a minute ago, not feeling judged, just, I think you said, learn and feel. What do you mean by that? What were you learning? Well, I was taught that, you know, there's good and bad and all of these things. And I, and I feel like there is good and bad according to a belief system or a judgment system. And that can change depending on who has that. But it, when you're looking at your life, when you're looking at your life and it's like you're having your life review and you're seeing from, from the beginning of your life all the way to the end and you get to see there's, and I'm sure all of your, you've had these, I've had these where there's very pivotal points in your life where, where you chose to do something or where you're like, I need to, you know, be more loving or, you know, maybe you, you decided not to be more loving or you, you had these conscious choices of how to move forward. And when, after you die, you get to review this. What I found with me is like, I studied myself, you know, in between lives um, and so also what was very pertinent is you get, so I just want to share, cause I think some, sometimes, uh, people have a hard time with this is, is, is that, you know, when you are on that state, you have a very visceral knowing that this other person that maybe you hated or you were angry at actually is you. And so you realize that everyone who ever interacted with was you the, the issue is, is down here, when we're a human, we have this illusion of separateness and part of it, we need, you know, we need to have some separateness in order to like live our life. But, you know, we think that this person doesn't matter or that's not me. Um, how I treat them doesn't matter, but actually it does because that is you. And so it's when you have your life review and maybe you were, didn't realize that, you know, these other people in the world are actually, you know, part of God and they are part of you. Maybe you didn't treat them a certain way or, or whatever. And so when, when you're dead and all of the illusions drop and you're reviewing from that point of view, you get to see how you affected you, how you affected a person and you get to feel this and you get to learn judgment. It's not, there's no judgment. There's just, awakening because once you once all of these illusions that that we believe as truth here fall when we die then the truth the real truth comes out um and i think that's where a lot of us i mean hopefully we learn when we're you know in our body but i think there's also a lot of healing and learning when when we're on the other spiritual side of, as well yeah, it's uh, it's sort of a tool we've been given. Our spirit is right now within this physical body, right? Mm-hmm. So we have an we have legs so that we can move around. Yeah, and and when you're in the spirit world, you're you were able to absorb so much more knowledge and everything going on. But here we have this brain that, while it does a good job for us, it limits us a lot as well. To have this very impactful experience of being knowing myself without a body and without a brain and knowing myself as pure consciousness and then being me being like pushed back in and you know being operating in a human suit and a nervous system I was like I felt a little bit imprisoned for a while 
Yeah, that's very common. And I like the terminology you just used in a human suit. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, it is. Cause it's, yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. So in what ways was it hard when you came back to deal with everything besides your body was probably in all kinds of pain and disarray? How long was that recovery, by the way, oh. physically? Oh, I mean, it went on for decades because, I mean, the the initial recovery, it depends on how you like, you know, stage it. But um, it took about two and a half years of surgeries back back and forth and in a wheelchair for me to actually be like able, so it was about two and a half years where I could walk and I didn't have to have any more surgeries on my leg. So I would, I would, I would have a surgery and then my, it would, the surgery in Mexico that failed. And so I did another one. And then I had another, have another two ones. So I learned how to walk again. And then my arm, when I had several on that, several on my, or one on my jaw, but then, you know, after you're after the surgeries, and if any of your listeners have had surgeries or had major trauma, you know, that's just the beginning because your whole body of, of getting back to, I, I could hardly walk up a flight of stairs without being tired because I lost all of my muscle mass from being bedridden. Sure. So, I mean, my, I was in pain, like physical pain for about, so 99, it happened. I was 15. I wasn't out of physical pain till I was like 31 or 30. Wow. That is really serious, but it doesn't bother you anymore. No, I wanted to come back and share about it. And so as I'm going back into my body and it is like lightning speed, once you decide you're like, yes, I'm going back. It's like, bam, like you're back there. And as like in that millisecond before, like that divine knowing that consciousness was like, bring this consciousness, bring this love into earth and anchor it into earth. And I was like, I can remember like, what? Like this whole thing. And so this question of how am I, how am I, me, this, you know, young girl, how am I supposed to bring this consciousness, this love, this, this amazing frequency down to earth? Like that was like my prayer and it still is my prayer. How can I more bring this down here and I guess my answer to that first was to my body because my body was so hurt. And so when I would be lying in the hospital in horrible pain, I would channel and I would connect to that light and to that consciousness of love where like there is nothing more powerful than that frequency when you, when we die or that love, that constant there, that is like, there is nothing more powerful than that. And so I would just connect to it and I would be like, please heal my body, please heal my pain. And so I would do that. And then, you know, as I got healed and a lot of, a lot of that is first bringing it to my body, but then it's also like, well, how do I bring that to my interactions? How, how do I bring that frequency into my daily life, into, um, into my relationships, you know? And I mean, I'm like, how do I anchor this into the world? I mean, like, that was, that's still my question. And then it'll, and it'll still probably be my question till I die as someone who had a near death experience in 99. So it'll be 24 years ago. I mean, when I came back, I didn't, I didn't say anything to anyone because I thought someone was going to think I was nuts. So you asked about me coming back. Well, I came back and then I was, you know, thrown into this drama movie, you know, it was like a movie that, you know, you watch, it's like a Hollywood thriller. I'm in Mexico. They don't know if I'm dying. They don't know, you know, there, it was this whole drama. I had to get airlifted out. So it's all of this, but I can remember being in the hospital and communicating with my angels and being like, um, this really sucks. Like, and that's like a big S like in capital letters, like the amount of pain I was in, the amount of pain I've experienced in my life is just, is just insane. And I was like, and my angels, I was communicating with them and they're like, yep, you're going to be in pretty serious shape for like 10 years. So, you know, watch out, like kind of like pace yourself. And I was like, I don't want to be here. And I was like, can I go back? And they're like, nope. <laughs> it was kind of like, 
you missed that window. And I was like, okay. We do need to wrap up. I want to go full circle quickly before we do and go back to what you were saying in the beginning. 14-year-old little Allison had big, big questions that you were praying for answers to. Were those answered through your experience? Uh, Yes, 100%. And lastly, you were sent back with a mission with something to communicate. Mm -hmm. Why don't you summarize that and tell it to the world right now? Hmm. Love is who we inherently are. And the more we tune into that within our hearts and also communicate that with others and also listen and witness to each other, we can, anything's possible. So world peace, healing of um, anything, creating any goals. So it's really that we are so powerful in our own consciousness. And I am really excited about the future because I feel like we are in such a precious time in history where we are, we have never in history have we been so connected to, so I can share spiritual, you know, across the world, share this with other people. Also never have we been so connected where we can heal trauma. We can talk about things. It is so open now where we can heal emotionally, where we can really communicate with different cultures, like clear hate, hatred, clear violence through love, communication, connection, understanding. And I am really excited to be a part of, of this, you know, through teaching people how to heal themselves heal others, but then also being a part of a bigger conversation of, of love and connection and, and, and greater awakening, um, across this world, because I, I feel like it's happening right now. And there is a lot of polarity happening, but I think that that is normal during a a global awakening and that, that we're right on track. And this is the setup for, uh, for a lot of people, to open up and, and to get into their power, um, of their love and of their consciousness. And I just hope people can really on your show can really hear that and really internalize that there's so much more than what the world tells them. And I see it and I, and I feel it when I meet all different people from all different walks of life. And I want to share that everything that you do makes a difference. Every loving text, every smile, everything matters. Allison, hey, thanks a lot for your time. Thank you. I'm, I am so appreciate it. And sending all of your listeners um, so many blessings and love and... Um, it was, it was such a pleasure. If you have had a round trip death experience, we would love to hear about it. Send an email to eric at roundtripdeath.com. And lastly, if you've found this program uplifting, if it's given you just a little more hope in the future, share it with a friend, hit that follow button, and take a few seconds to write us a review. Until next time, I wish you everything good that you're looking for in this life and the next.